Hey, this is Jay. And this is Chelsea. Welcome to the Shifting Perceptions Podcast. We are bringing you inspiration to live a more creative lifestyle because our favorite people are the ones that choose the path less traveled. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 24. This is Chelsea Alders. And this week, we get to introduce you to the ever positive and ridiculously talented surf photographer, Sean Davey. In this interview, we really just wanted you all to get a taste of the man behind the art. Sean's photography is widely known and has been featured on over 140 magazine covers. He has published four books and collaborated on many more, traveled just about anywhere and everywhere there is a wave or ocean available, and has many ongoing displays and shows in Hawaii. We chose to interview Sean because, well, you'll see. After 10 minutes of his storytelling, his childlike love for his craft, his adoration of the sea, and those who make a career out of it, you will love him the way we do. We have known Sean for almost 10 years, actually over 10 years, and let me tell you, from the second we met him on the beach of the North Shore, we could not get enough. His energy fills us up. We covered old school photography methods and the craft of surf photography, how Sean simply makes decisions based on what he loves doing, and then we get to chat about his gnarly wife, growing up in Tasmania as a triplet, Eddie Vedder, Barack Obama, Hawaii's scariest waves, and the biggest surf moments he has witnessed living on the North Shore. I think this episode will have you seeing the bright side of your art form, whatever that may be, and maybe even make you realize which parts of your craft or job make you more playful. Because guess what? Those are the things you should probably be focusing on. We hope you love every second. Hey, everyone. Jay Alders here. While you are listening to this epic conversation with our buddy, Sean, you could check out his website, seandavey.com, or on Instagram. You can follow him and check out his amazing work at Sean. S-E-A-N underscore Davey. You can find me on Instagram at J Alders. You can find our podcast on Instagram at Shifting Perceptions Podcast. Chelsea, you can find on Instagram at Chelsea Alders or at Om Mamas Doulas or at OmMamasDoulas.com. She's a birth doula and you could check out what she's doing. That being said, we're going to jump in. If you guys haven't done so already, I invite you to please click subscribe on your podcast player let's jump in hey bro how are you how are you you, mate not too shabby well you know a bit shabby the last time i saw you but you know (laughs) (laughs) so have you listened to any of these so far i did actually um i listened to her awesome and and uh can't think which ones they were, but they were around that same time. Uh, well, I was travelling at the time, so it was perfect. Uh, where did you travel? <laughs> I was actually on my way back from LA. I was over there shooting the Santa Anna's. Oh, the place is beautiful when the Santa Anna's are happening. I mean, it's beautiful and deadly, actually, because Santa Anna's also bring the fires because the winds come off the dead. It's so weird, though, you know, because, I mean, as much as it brings all the fires and all the – and then – maybe the rains and the mudslides and what have you, um, it just makes the surf so perfect there. Like, cause when I, I remember when I was young, like a teenager, reading the big American surfing magazine, Surfing and Surfer, they were the two big bags. Mm-hmm. I would always see these most beautiful pictures of waves in California, from California, and inevitably they would have the tagline, Woody Woodworth. And so... This guy, I was, I was left with the impression that, wow, California is like the best place in the world. It's just got the most perfect waves. And I'm living in Australia. You know? <laughs> yeah, that's a pretty bold statement. <laughs> you guys know how beautiful it is there. All the beaches are But, but um, you know, that's when it happens when you get the Santa Ana as it blows the wind straight offshore. And this year, because they hadn't had any much rain, the water was super clean, like, Huntington Beach. No, uh, no needles floating around clean, or the waves were clean. No, yeah. Usually, it's usually it's kind of muddy looking the water, right? But when I was there, it was as clean as Indonesia. And I'm not talking Bali Indonesia. I'm talking remote Indonesia. I've never been to Indonesia, so you can say any Indonesia, and it wouldn't mean it anything. doesn't make a difference. But I can oh, picture wow. it Sounds in my pretty head. Great. Yeah. Think of the most pristine, aqua clean water you can think of. Huntington was like that. That's hard to picture. It was glowing. It was glowing aqua. I'm, I'm like, what? 
Wow. We get water like that in Jersey every so often in the summer. We'll walk out to the beach and we're like, what just happened? I feel like we're, we're we can, on like, like see a, our feet. in the it's Caribbean. Weird. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah because time. Jersey's not exactly known for, uh, you know, having super clean. Well, it's nice when it's small, but then once the swell gets big, it churns it all up and right. it's yeah. it doesn't really have that look anymore, right? Yeah. But it, I remember when I visited you guys back in 07, was it? Oh, and man. I think it was, yeah, yeah right actually, yeah, you're probably and right, yeah. It was beautiful. The waves were just so beautiful. I remember how enamored I was with that one water shoot that I did. Yeah, yeah I couldn't pull you away. I remember we did a little bit of shooting in was that um, Asbury. We were first in Belmar and then Spring Lake, and then Sean convinced yeah, me to like Asbury. wake up before sunrise, which I usually don't do willingly. <laughs> and uh, we went to Asbury Park and, and shot the sunrise, which uh, I was the looking at those hour. photos recently. We had some pretty cool ones, actually. The golden hour. Yeah. Mate, you got to chase the light. You, you being an artist should be all over that. Right. Sunrise. Yeah. Right? Get and, look, if you don't get up early, you should make a habit of starting to do so because you're going to see all kinds of crazy new ideas and visuals. Well, do. Sean, I'll tell you, you wouldn't know it from your perspective because I know mm-hmm. you are a twin, but being the father a of twins. A you're a triplet. Oh, shit. I forgot about yeah. that. Yeah, triplet. No, I, not only am I a triplet, I was born the same year as those triplets. What triplets? Those three triplets. Which ones? The ones that were just on CNN, the uh, oh. three identical strangers. I don't watch CNN. I'm not, oh, a, not in that. airports enough. Uh, I understand. Well, <laughs> I, I wasn't watching it for CNN. I, was, I wanted to see that program. It's about these three guys. I couldn't were, imagine being your dad with like three. I picture three, even though your siblings five, are probably so not like you. Five of you. Yeah. Jesus. I picture five little Sean Davies oh, running boys. around like oh, madmen. Yeah, that's... <laughs> <laughs> Although you said your brothers not really like you, right? Um, well, no, I've got four brothers. So we're well, all you're, twin, you're twin brother. Tri- well, actually, okay, so I'm a triplet. Okay, what, triplet. What, what, you're confused. But aren't you an identical twin, though? Well, there were two. There were two eggs, and one split into a further two. That was those guys. So they look pretty similar to each other. Okay. Oh, so they're oh, identical, they identical, not you. Gotcha. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like they call me the milkman, but actually, I look at our looks, and I look most like our parents. So I call them the milkman. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Holy crap! I'm sorry about the sore throat. I've had this really bad uh, flu. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Everyone that's been on this podcast this month has been sick, so don't Including worry. Join the club. Yeah. Well, I never. Get- I was getting to the point, though, like, imagine how your parents felt with five of you, because, like, you're saying, oh, yeah, Jay, just wake up and go shoot the sunrise and go paint. And- <laughs> yeah, right, dude. <laughs> pa- parenting comes first, and yeah. sleep is sleep comes first. He wakes up and gets, like, five minutes to meditate before it's time for pancakes, so that's... Well, I don't want to sleep in as much as the next person, but I don't want to waste the day, you know? It's yeah. like, I'll get up in the dark, and I'll go and get a shoot done, and- and I'll be I'll be leaving the beach as the sun comes up. Oh like God. I'm chasing very specific kinds of light, and sometimes I don't even need I don't even wish for the direct sunlight. I'm shooting the pre dawn. Well, but, so Sean, but you don't have three toddlers, so yeah, you don't. Have so there, but anyway, <laughs> anyway, so I actually so let's let's get a firm start on this podcast. So first, we're just going to say hello, and then I really want to like jump into. A little bit about like all of your amazing stories that you always have us so enamored by. That's so. kind of like a soft open. We could just run with that. No? Okay, there you go. Hi, Sean. <laughs> hey, Sean. <laughs> hey, mate. Good day, mate. I'm gonna have a really hard time um, <laughs> keeping my my horrible Tasmanian accent at bay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which is funny because i always want to talk like you when i talk to you and then when i'm talking to you i always catch you in like the uh trying to do an american accent you try to pronunciate words like an american which i actually appreciate quite a bit no we appreciate it actually i've heard you drunk and going off on a tasmanian yeah. rampage and it's hard to keep up <laughs> <laughs> Well, I feel like our podcast listeners are starting to adjust to the Australian accent. This is our third yeah. Aussie on here, which is, I mean. So I didn't quite get that because your, your microphone's lower than Jay's, so Jay's is a lot louder. Oh, it Sorry is? About that. I feel like I'm yeah. so loud. Maybe it's Chelsea's American accent. <laughs> I can't hear my accent. Oh, look, I can hear you <laughs> she said there, mate. She said, uh, you know. <laughs> no, I, said, I said, I think our listeners are adjusting to this Australian accent thing because you're our third Aussie on here. Yeah. Oh, and you know what? Um, it's not like you can run subtitles. 
exactly. <laughs> so you have to make sure you enunciate. Yes. Oh my god. Oh my like cow. I remember um, back in the day we used to like do whatever the old version of FaceTiming was, whatever that was, and I used to have to like watch your lips as you spoke because we'd be like we'd be like smoking and talking to each other, and I'd be like, "What, dude?" <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man. Yeah. Anyway, so Sean, so we want to get our uh, listeners up to speed on who the heck you are. And um, can you kind of tell us, you know, how this whole surf photography thing started? Because you've been doing this for over 40 years now, which is insane. And I know you started as like a teenager. Can you give us kind of like the uh, story and how that all happened? Yeah. How did you go from like a teenage photographer to like being the guy that everyone wanted to be shot by in Hawaii? Talk to us about the story. Mm-hmm. I was just a typical surf, surf stoke grommet, you know, living living at one of the Sydney city beaches, which was Bronte Beach, beautiful little spot. And uh, I would just write, you know, race home from high school every day, get a couple of buses, you know. I'd just be, you know, straight home so I could go for a surf. But um, this one day I, I came home and the waves were perfect, but they were tiny. They were like a four or six inches there. You know? They were just tiny, but they were perfect. I'm just sitting there tortured by the fact that these waves were so perfect and I couldn't surf them. I was like, oh, I just need to get amongst them somehow. And then I, then I remembered the, the crappy little Kodak Instamatic camera that someone had given me a couple of years ago that was stashed in the back of the water at home. So I ran home and got that and um, advanced the lever. Yeah, there was some film there. So I ran back down the beach and... I didn't just, t- I, only, I only took one photograph, but it wasn't just one photograph. I, I waited and I actually knelt down to get the perspective right, which was interesting because that was the very first picture I ever took. And I had the perspective thing going right from the get go. So anyway, I got this picture back of just this little wave barreling on the beach and I showed my friends and they were like, oh, how good is that? How come there's no one out there? And I'm like, hello. <laughs> oh, this is interesting. You know. A little light bulb went off, and uh, I've just been obsessed with photography ever since that point. And that was that was actually October the twentieth, I think, nineteen seventy-seven. If I remember right. Whoa! I'm looking it up right as we speak. So, did you grow up in like a surf-centered town where you were? Oh yeah, oh yeah. So everyone yeah. was like stoked, and you grew up in that culture. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Were there other photographers that were kind of shooting that you were like, "Hey, I could be like that guy over there." No, it wasn't. So photographers were, were really rare right through my career, actually, up until about... Instagram. <laughs> well, uh, until, until I started coming to Hawaii, that's where I started seeing numbers of surf photographers, right? And that was early 90s. And then, you know, of course, you know, it got cheapened throughout the digital era and stuff, and there was a photographer. Damn, iPhones, don't they take great photos these days? <laughs> um, so you know, yeah, for a while there, surf photographers were quite rare and, and in demand. You know, like we could get a lot of work. It was good. So, were you shooting like from that point forward? You just said, "Hey, I'm going to keep doing this surf photography thing." Uh, I wasn't really thinking about it as a future or as a business or anything like that. I was just doing it because I was stoked on it. Yeah, it just you know, and I, when I look back. Gee, I sure winged it through my career. I mean, the number of times I didn't have much money, if anything, in the bank. And uh, where's rent coming from this week? And bam, there's a, they'll pop up a check, you know, from the magazine. Okay, that's taken care of. Cool. Back to work yeah. yeah, yeah. It, it, it was like that right through my whole career and didn't bother me at all because it, I was doing what I love to do, you know, just pursuing what I love to do. Well, so how old were you when you moved to Hawaii? Oh. That was 97, so I'm 57 now. Um, You're going to make us do the math here? What did you like? Okay. What did you um, like think you were going to be doing when you were 16 and, and 18 and 20? What, what were you like thinking your career might be someday, or were you thinking that at all? I wasn't even thinking that at all. No. I was just being a typical grom, surf, typical surf grom. So were you more into surfing or you were more into the photography when you were in your like late I was more into teens, the 20s? More I into mean, I dug, I dug the photography, but I look back when I used to, when I moved back to Tassie, because I lived in Sydney, you know, throughout my teens, but I'm from Tasmania. And when I moved back to Tasmania in my 
my late teens, I definitely took my, my surfboard and my wetsuit and everything as, just as much as I took my camera gear, if, if not a bit more. So I was more, I was still more of a surfer than I was a photographer, but I was in a boat, definitely. Yeah, you know, like I, I remember sometimes when uh, I would even go to the extreme of hitchhiking to the beach, and in and in Hobart, Tasmania, hitchhiking from the to the beach from Hobart is a big mission. It would take a few hours just to get to the beach. Wow. And I'd have to, I'd, I'd have a surfer now, and I'd have to turn around and go back already. <laughs> Oh my gosh. I feel like that is a little bit more like recognized. Well, even in just all these surf villages, like in Sydney or in Australia and maybe Tasmania, but in Hawaii, like you can hitchhike if you have a surfboard in your hand. It's like accepted. Yeah, you could in Tassie back in those days. I mean, it was a, the surf community. We all kind of knew each other. So it, it worked. Yeah. Were so, there, were there like uh, any pro surfers or up and coming surfers where you grew up that? kind of you you sort of connected with as your career took off sure there's a very famous one actually we knew him when he was really young shane horan oh yeah okay and yeah he he actually lived at bronte with us when we were in our like uh, you know 10 11 kind of thing and then and then um, back then we we're all riding foam surfboards it wasn't boot they weren't boogies they were foam surfboards right huh. um and shane moved to bondi and and Oh, the, the fiberglass surfboards, we used to call them fibos. Like, oh, gee, Shane moved to Bondi and got a fibo. <laughs> <Woo-hoo!"> <laughs> <You know? laughs> Moving on up in the world. I love it. <laughs> yeah, of course. And he, he went to great heights. I mean, not only was he the second best surfer in the world, but he was also the Australian skateboard champion. I mean, he was an achiever. Yeah. It's cool. He's a good black show. So how, so this is like, uh, we just watched that documentary on HBO with Kelly Slater and all those guys. And I don't think that I really realized back in the nineties, the feud between sort of like the Australian surfers and the U S surfers. So oh, it's yeah, like, was a bit, yeah. yeah. So as a photographer coming from there and coming to the U S like, were you photographing those competitions? Were you seeing a lot of that happen? Not really. I mean, I wasn't really chasing the contest too much. I mean, actually, when, when I lived in Sydney, I would go to the contest because everybody would be there. I mean, it was, I don't know, it was just it's nice to nice to be there amongst the little get the pictures and stuff. But um, I never really saw any fights going on. You'd hear about them, yeah. You know, like, uh, but uh, you, you, actually, you would typically hear about the fights coming out of Europe for some reason, okay. particularly France. There'd been, there'd been a fight between uh, Andy Irons and Mick Campbell. I remember that one. Uh, there was a few. You yeah, know. so interesting. It was, it, was, it was a lot looser back in the day, though, less professional. And more, it was, yeah, I think back to pro surfing, say, um, late 80s, early 90s, it was a big old party tour from what, from what I could gather. You know, it was like they were just partying everywhere they went in the world. And I guess Europe was as, was as party issues they got. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, so then so, you're in, so once you moved to Hawaii. Wait, what t- got you to Hawaii in the first yeah, place? Like so you're, you grew that. up in like a beautiful country. You got great waves. Mm-hmm. Like what made you think, hey, I want to like pick up and move across the world to Hawaii? Well, well, actually, I had no interest in going to Hawaii initially because simply because all the other photographers went there. And I'm, I was kind of like one who likes to do their own thing. But then um, I had this Japanese um, client and she wanted me to go to Hawaii so she paid my way over here. I'm like, okay, I'll go check it out, have a look. I liked it. It was cool. And then, I, um, you know, uh, I think it was second season, I met my future wife and that was how I ended up moving here was, yeah. I, yeah. So I moved, I moved here for love. <laughs> <laughs> Always because of chicks, man. <laughs> Throws in that Elvis, that U.S. Elvis accent. I like it. Well, so oh, well, <laughs> thank you very much, baby. <laughs> when, <laughs> thank you, thank you very much. Oh cool. my god! <laughs> when you met Lane, was she pro already, or she was just training to being she was her? Pro. Yeah, oh, she, she was. was. Pro, she was a pro surfer, but she wasn't like doing every single contest kind of pro. Okay, she was uh, doing like. Oh, Hawaiian ones. And she did travel to, the, for, to a few events like France and South Africa and stuff. That's cool. Yeah, she used to get out there. And, oh, man. But I think back, cause back then she was also running her own clothing business, which is called Us Girls. Yeah. I think her website's usgirlshawaii.com. Yeah. 
unfortunately, a porn, a porn site got the name before we could. <laughs> we should like specify to everyone: your wife is like still, still a badass. Like she's still out there at, at Pipeline, which is Every arguably morning. the most dangerous, one of the most dangerous breaks in the entire planet Earth, and she's out there and uh, she, charging. She lost one of her fellow drilling patrols last week. Actually, I saw that. Yeah. She was pretty, yeah, she, I've never seen her that upset. She was super upset. She thought she, she, thought she could have saved him, but she actually saw him go under. Oh, that's, why she, that's why she was upset. Did he, did the guy hit the reef? Is that what happened? Or they don't he had a massive heart attack. Oh, Jesus. That's a horrible yeah. Yeah. way to go on pipeline, huh? Actually, it's funny that, the, well, the guy, he was really dedicated to that, that spot. He'd surf there every morning, pretty much like she does, and, he was. So, he had told someone recently he he would like to go at pipeline. Uh, Not that and, way, probably. Though. Yeah, probably no, but still. But better I than dying like, cancer or something horrible like that. Isn't yeah, it? it's true. Freak. It's a better place to be. Doing yeah. what you love. Well, I feel like being out there, you have been witness or you know close by for a lot of these big tragedies. I mean, pipeline's no joke. It's like it happens. Cool. Yeah, I, I remember when the late Joy from Tahi died. It was very unexpected. It wasn't a big day. It was about eight to ten foot, really clean, beautiful day actually. And the, even the wave that he wrote, that he surfed on, it was a, quite a normal wave. But there's some. I guess he didn't pop up, and people were looking around for him, and it took him quite a while. There was over a hundred people stopped surfing and ran down the beach to try and help. It was huge. Sean, Please. can you can you yeah. like tell me about the dialogue like in your head when your wife is out there at Pipeline every morning? Like, is that something that is or was like consciously a thought or a worry, or do you just not even think about it, or do you just accept that's a possibility? Like, what's the dialogue? All that either either between you or in your head, all <laughs> that stuff. Like, you- oh, like oh well, I, I don't obsess over it. You know, I mean, she's doing what she loves to do. We we both accept that something could happen, and that's just part of part of what happens, you know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I got plenty of faith in her. She's pretty smart. She if if it's, if it's you know if it's dangerous, she's going to be really cautious. So it's yeah. just what it is, you know. I try. I, I mean, if I, look, if I thought it, if I'm worried about it all the time, I'd go crazy because she does this every morning. Yeah. This is what I do. No, yeah, this is what she does. You have know? lost it a long time ago. <laughs> well, so talk about, so I want to talk about your evolution of um, surf photography because I think you've gone in and out of like you were in the waves of people, you're out, you like the ocean itself, not so much surfing. Like there's been a lot of ins and outs. So let's talk about the stuff you love and what you kind of started doing and some of these magazine covers. Like, let's talk about these early evolutions. Like, what was your first big, like, what were you photogra- photographing first that you got attention for? Hmm. Well, I can still remember sending my first pictures to surf magazines. This was Australian Surfing World magazine. And uh, I was sending him, I basically I was shooting on net color negative film and sending him prints, of course. Right? This is what you typically do as an amateur. Back then, yeah, and uh, he said to me, he sent me a letter back saying, like, "You really should use slide film because if you're going to get published, it'll be on that." You know, and he basically was giving me all these little, yeah, you know, hints about how I need to go about doing things. And so I ended up being a uh, a long time user of Kodachrome. God, that's a beautiful film. But I look at it now, and it, it definitely was a problematic film, a little bit too much contrast and stuff, but it was just so rich. Then, of course, when Velvia came along, oh, Velvia was such a revolutionary film. Never, ever been another film like it. The reason Velvia was such a uh, um, good film was uh, Fuji Chrome, who made it, actually licensed Kodak's T-Grain and Konica's Hex-Grain. And they use their own grain, so they use these three different grains, one for each colour layer, and by doing so, they were able to prevent the colours from bleeding into each other, which, of course, made it sharper. Wow. So, and like, your so, early photos, you can see that you were using these these products? Yeah. I, I, I love the old slide films. I think, most, I think most listeners right about now are like, what's film? <laughs> <laughs> no. Yeah, I know, I know. But no, it's like super retro now. It's like cool. Oh, yeah, I know. Is that funny? How old is new again? But, yeah. Um, I was looking at a, uh, some old slide. 
you know, pages of slides just a couple of days ago, and I was just marvelling at the colour of them on the light box. It was so deluxe. I'm looking at it going, God, that, you know, that looks just every bit as be- even better than digital. Yeah. It looks so good. Look, I'm actually looking at a slide and look at the colour of that thing. It is awesome. You know what, bro? Like listening to you talk, I like I'm just thinking about one of the qualities that I love about you is like you have this like inner child of Sean that's like still like a stoked sixteen year old. Like I I, I, you'd like I think about all the times what you've like texted me or we've gotten online and like you're like you're like just so stoked. You're like, oh mate, you gotta check out these photos and you're like looking at them all and sending them to me and like just like your stoke is like never ending and it's just great to see that. How have you maintained like that level of like complete appreciation of your subject matter and what you're doing, even while balancing all the career struggles that no doubt we all suffer? I think actually being one of five kids, we all struggle to get attention. And so I have this willingness to share. If I see something really cool or do something really cool, I want, I want to share that. I want to share it to my friends and stuff. And so uh, I think it has maybe something to do with that. It's just the, the, it, it, and in that need to share. To, to, uh, I, 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 I love the idea of staking someone else out. I guess that's what it is. I go, oh, you've got to see this. Really like this, and usually when I go to show you something, it's something that I want to show you because it kind of connects me with your work. Yeah, generally, like that high and mighty photo, uh, the high and mighty painting that you You've did. Always loved yeah, that you one. Love I that love one. that one. So yeah. I love that's one of my favorite paintings by anyone ever. Wow, dude, ever. I mean, that picture really speaks to me, and I, I took a picture of a wave one morning, just like it. Do you remember me sending you that picture? Yes, totally. He was standing right up, just like your painting. It was amazing. And so, yeah, I saw that. I just, oh, I've got, got to show this to Jack. You know, like, how could I not show him this? He's got to see this. He's got to be inspired by it, no doubt. You know, so. Why do you think people, like, don't have that like deep connection like you do with like with art, with music, with photography? you just have like this amazingly intense connection and appreciation of it. And I think a lot of people as, as we all get older, like lose touch with that, like magic in the world. What sort of, I don't know, like what sort of uh, lessons or, or observations do you think you have or can share since you like to share stuff that most people just kind of forget about or don't notice? You forget to stop and smell the roses. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, totally. What that's what it is. That's that's what I do. Everything I do, I'm pretty much stopping to smell the roses. Um, I just, I don't know. I just have you always been like that? Yeah, I, I, I really appreciate creativity, and when I see it, I, I really embrace it, and you know, in all its forms. You know, um, it's interesting actually because I was listening to some eighties Aussie rock the other day, and I was just like. <sighs> music was so cool back in the day it still is man and I was just like really getting into those couple of bands you know and I was thinking oh, this stuff sounds just as good as it did back then how cool is that you know Yeah. so I think it's just being able to continue to appreciate what you know what stokes you out but regardless whether it's music or visuals or even even taste and smell come on I mean it's just it's all it's how many senses we got five senses Taste, smell, myself. <laughs> Making sure they're all there. Bye. Yep, yep, check, check. What am I missing? I'm missing one. Touch. Uh, Touch. Psychicness. Okay. Yes. Yeah, t- yeah, yeah, well, that's not a that's not L- official Levitation. List. <laughs> it's not official. <laughs> it's not in the official list. <laughs> um, I just, you gotta, you, you, you can't lose sight of what makes you happy, I guess. You know, a lot of people are so, um, uh, um, Involved in their just running, running their everyday lives, and I bet you guys fit into that mold because you've got all these kids and stuff to <laughs> to manage. Yeah. Not mention all the businesses you guys run. Oh. Yeah, we try to have we try to have fun with all of it. Well, actually, that's it. You got to have fun with whatever you do, right? And so I always try and have a measure of of creativity in my day. Because, like that's what motivates me to get up really early, early in the morning and go and shoot pictures because. Um, I can I can be up and shooting pictures and, and, and have finished 
and then going on about my normal day. And other people aren't even out of bed yet. And I'm like, oh, you've already slayed the beast today and now, now go and have the rest of your day. You know, like, I do that. I just can't. I'm just motivated to create. And, you know, a lot of my best photos, actually, um, they just come come about from being there. Like, I, I never intended to get that picture. It just sort of happened along the way. Many of my best images happen that way. It's, it's just a matter of being out there and to get the picture. If you're not yeah. there, you're not going to get the picture. Well, I think that was one of the first times that we like, so that we first met you in Hawaii, like way back, way in the MySpace days. We'll go back to 2006. MySpace. MySpace. I miss yeah. MySpace. Yeah. It's so good. <laughs> MySpace was awesome. Uh, but I remember like yeah. literally in the same breath that you were like, yeah, you'll see Eddie Vedder walking across this beach. You were like talking <laughs> to us like it was no big deal. And then in, I remember you running back to the, you're like, oh, you got it. You got to get right in there. Look, look, look. Cause you like spotted this majestic scene in the ocean. And for me, I was like, what is happening right now? And oh, it was yeah. so he, like, cool. staged the whole shoot. And yeah. Like- and then he's like running up and down the beach to get this perfect spot. And it was like, what, I, like, I just saw the ocean, but you had seen this amazing light going right on this wave. And it was like such a cool thing to see you being so playful in this space that I'm so used to seeing you on the other end of a computer. I just see what comes out of it. I didn't never seen that process before. So it's not just that you're like playful in that. It's like you literally have so much fun doing what you do. I which do. Is- it's, it's nice. To, it's nice to enjoy what you do. And, you know, like people say, um, uh, enjoy what you do and you'll never work a day in your life. Well, that's so true. Yeah. You know, it's so, if you're working for yourself and you really enjoy what you do, um, it just, the, the creativity just flows. Well, so let's talk about that because I think so many of our listeners, like they really just need the courage to do what they love to do. So Mm -hmm. was there ever times in this scary part where you like, you know, you were going paycheck to paycheck when you were like, man, maybe I should get a job doing something else. Yeah. I, 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 I worked in uh, high-end colour laboratories for about 10 years, throughout the 80s and 90s. Actually, mainly the 80s. A little bit into the 90s, but not much. <coughs> and um, uh, I remember at one stage, well, actually, I learned a lot working in those colour labs, by the way. I learned a lot. I bet. So much more than the average photographer. So what do you do in I, the colour labs? Like, what do you what, what is that? Every, Everything. Okay. I mean, process light films, printed uh, color, black and white. Okay. Um, duplicated slides. I even, I even uh, pioneered a couple of new techniques using different film stocks and stuff. But anyway, I'm, at one stage, I was driving an hour and a half each way to work, and most of it was sitting still, not even moving. And I was just like, "Wow, fifteen hours a week." I'm wasting sitting in this car seat. I'm over that. I can't do that. I cannot waste that much time every week. So I quit my job. I went out on my own simply because I was I was motivated to not waste that 15 hours every week. And so, yeah, I, I, it was scary because I had to go out on my own, but I had enough faith in myself that I could do it, and I pulled it. And I've been working for myself ever since, and that was like, Nineteen ninety or something, somewhere around there. Ninety one. Yeah. So yeah, and surf photography back then was pretty good. It was a pretty good gig. You get you you'd get to travel a lot, usually on someone else's coin, typically a magazine or a sponsor, and you'd get to shoot all these crazy beautiful places. And actually, along the way, not only did I shoot surfing, but of course I shot all the scenery and the the beautiful, just the beautiful generic pictures that you see along the way. And a lot of those make make up what is my archive now. And, I, you know, I add to that archive typically on an every other day basis. I just, I still, I yeah, I, I can look back every year and think, yeah, the quality of your work is still getting better. That's pretty cool, you know, mm-hmm. stuff like that. Because I've always been about the quality of the image, trying to shoot, I try and use the best, quality camera that I can at the time and, uh, yeah, get that lens just as focused as perfectly as I can, stuff like that. There's a lot of really detailed stuff that most people don't know about, especially with water photography. A lot of people struggle to shoot pictures in the water because there's, there's, a, there's this one golden rule with water photography that I've 
I've worked it out over the years, and most people don't even know it. And I think probably a a great number of surf photographers don't even know it. But it is. If you're going to shoot – okay, hang on. A lot of people struggle to get their cameras to focus. And what it is is um, you have this thing called dry port versus wet port, port being the the front of the housing that houses your camera, right? And a, a dry port is where you put a little bit of car polish, you said, Dad, and you run, a, run a, you, you rub it over the port and then buff it off, right? And when water hits it, it just beads straight off. That's called a dry port. Okay. And then a wet port is where you actually lick the port with your tongue until you create like a film. It creates this very fine film. And what happens when the water hits it, it just becomes a... Uh, one, it becomes one, the droplets don't show at all. They don't bit off, but it just becomes one. And that's called a wet port. And camera lenses over, over about 28 millimetre typically will have a hard time photographing through a wet port. Whereas if you're under 28 millimetre, you kind of want to have a wet port because a wide angle lens will show the droplets running off the port. So you have a wet port for your wide angles. And you have a dry port for your stronger lenses because the stronger lens won't photograph through a wet port. It won't focus through a wet port. It'll only focus through a dry port. Otherwise, it'll search. I know I'm probably getting a bit technical, but anyone who's interested in water photography is lapping this up right now. I'm telling right, you. I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, so do you find photographers that want either or? Like they're either on land or they're in the water, or do people try to do both? Like, is it like you just pick one and go mm-hmm. with it so that you can get really technical? Well, now that there's not a lot of money to be made in surf photography, people are probably choosing what they love and just running with it because they're doing it because they just like to do it. Yeah. Whereas when, when I was fully professional and there wasn't a lot of us out there, we would tend to do it all because that's what you, you had to be able to do it all in order to be hired and travel and stuff, right? So, But even so, most guys have a preference for water or lens photography and typically anyone who's a water photographer will just relish at the opportunity to shoot water photography because it's such a fun thing to do, swimming around and shooting waves and stuff. So especially, yeah, most places that you go tend to be uh, tropical, so you can't wait to get in the water anyway. The water's usually clear. and You know, it's just it's nice to be swimming around the water taking pictures. It's, it's a very creative place to be, and there's a lot of different ways to shoot. You, know, you, you can shoot from side on or you can swim underneath them as they go past above you and look up at them. I mean, it, it's so cool. The, the number of different ways you can create photographs in surf, it's, it's a really creative. So I have to ask, have you ever had any, like, holy shit moments in those waves? Like, where oh, you were yeah. Swimming? Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I had a couple. Give us, give us maybe a couple stories of, uh, of those moments yeah. where you got your uh, – you know, your ass handed to you. You took the words right out of my mouth then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, mate. Okay, one, one day I was swimming around out, out of an eight-foot back door, which is the right hander going off pipeline, right? And I could just start – I just noticed that the water was – that all the water was moving, not just the waves, but all the water was moving. And that's when it gets dangerous because you can get out of position really, really quickly. And that's kind of what happened. Like I got, pu- I got pulled in in front of where backdoor breaks, and it's super shallow in there. And I remember I was, I, I could see waves coming and I was swimming out and I went underwater. And usually when you're swimming out, the, the, the reef underneath you is, is moving towards your feet, right, as you, as you make progress out. But it, everything was going back the other way because the water, God. all the water was moving. And I remember looking at this two, these two peaks coming together. They were both eight foot waves, so it was like a, it was turning into a really big wave, like a 12 footer or something. And I'm looking up at it thinking, oh, shit, don't kill me. Just, just maim me. Just maim me. Just maim me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I dived somehow, I got under it and came up, and I was fine. But I just remember at the time thinking, okay, I'll be fine. Just so, did you me. have your camera on you? Oh, yeah. So what yeah, happened? Really, have you ever bailed on your camera? Like I feel like no, I'd be like, fuck the camera no, I'm out of here. <laughs> no, it, it's a little bit like a lioness in your security blanket. You okay. feel more secure with the camera in your hand. Okay. If I wasn't swimming with a camera in my hand, I'd feel naked. That's <laughs> that's how you that's how used to it I am. Yeah. 
It's like the board. I, I, yeah. yeah, I'd be totally t- fine swimming around out there with a camera in hand, but without a camera, I would feel weird. That is crazy. Like hearing you tell yeah. these stories, I imagine these like horrible, scary things happening, but you like laughing throughout the whole thing. I can't imagine. You actually, <laughs> I, I can't imagine you actually being scared. Have there been moments where you were like, yes, like, yes. like so terrified? You're like, fuck and, this. And when those <laughs> when those moments happen, you are laughing because yeah. you have adrenaline running yeah, through like you. Maniacal. You're like, you have yeah. hysterical <laughs> laughter happening right as you're about to go under. Oh I mean, God. you are. I mean, seriously. I've said I'm, one time I was at pipe and. Derek Ho caught this really big barrel from super deep, and all the photographers swam wide. And I'm like, I'm not going here. I'm shooting this. This thing's sick, right? <laughs> and so I, I shot it. I got a, yeah, I got a big old double spread and everything in the bag for it. But I remember that wave drew all the water off the reef, and then there was one right behind it. And I remember looking at it coming, thinking, Oh shit! Oh. Okay. Anyway, so I, I dived, and normally when you dive under a wave of pipe, you, there's a layer, of, there's a layer of foam, and then there's like maybe several, three or four feet of clear water, and you tend you tend to aim for that clear water bit and try and get under the wave, right? And so I was when I went to dive down, there was no clear water; it, it was just pounding like oh like fists into the reefs that came towards me. I'm like, oh shit, here we go! <laughs> and, and yeah, I just got. Annihilated, just threw around all over the place. I was down for a couple of hours, and I remember coming up, um, coming up, and I got sucked all the way down to, to Pupakea, like the longest walk back. Oh my God. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, no more water photos today. <laughs> 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 like it's it seems like you have the level of insanity to like have been like you know someone like your wife who's like charging pipeline like when did you stop or push push surfing aside uh, and just say yeah. nah i'm just gonna take my camera instead like yep. Yep, were there- i remember that i remember all that because okay I used, to, I used to shoot a lot of a lot of water stuff on the bigger days and i just i remember it got to a point where i'm just like yeah, I'll sit this one out, you know. And there was more of those sitting them out. And, and of course, when you're sitting it out, you're like, oh, yeah, I could have gone out right then. Yeah, I should have been down here with all my stuff. Could have made it out right then. You know, it's like that. You go through all that. And then eventually you get to a point where you're like, oh, I don't really care about this so much anymore. That's eh, all right. I'm happy. I've got, I'm going to use this technique. You know, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do And, you know, it's like, the monkey eventually just jumps off your back, you know. You yeah. know you're no longer uh, concerned about it. I think you, I think we all go through some kind of phase yeah. like that, you know, in, in, in pursuit, especially if we're doing something that's somewhat dangerous. But you like kept your passion for surfing, which I find interesting. Like you were, the the waves understandably like scared the shit out of you because they are pretty <laughs> terrifying in the winter over there. But yet it didn't scare you enough to get out of the water in those waves and it also still maintained your passion for surfing so it's those two things are sort of interesting hmm. well it's vis- I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a visual i'm a visualist I'm, I, I like creating really cool pictures and you know, i don't necessarily have to be swimming on the big days to get those pictures i can be on the beach in fact you know i find as i get older and i get more knowledge you know wisdom and all that sometimes it's, it's smarter to, to uh, actually take the land angle anyway. You know, yeah. that's, uh, the, the water angle is really a young guy's pursuit in most cases. There are some older, older guys I know around my age who are still totally doing it. And blows me away that they are. <laughs> they haven't got the monkey off their back yet. Yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> Especially like you have enough of those holy shit stories and you're like, yeah, I don't know if I'm up for that anymore. It just feels so wild out there. It's definitely a different ball game. And just to clarify for listeners, when – Sean says twelve foot East Coast. That's twenty four foot, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, just to let our, <laughs> let our listeners know what we're really talking about here. So, oh, I, I used to have this buddy of mine, Darren Crawford, who used to shoot a lot of water photography out there around the same time I did. And we'd all, we'd all, you know, just sitting out there chatting away in between waves and stuff. It was kind of like a social club almost. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, you know, we all came to the conclusion that you're not, you're not really. Uh, trying hard enough if you don't have at least one near-death experience each okay. season. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Like, uh, what about so what about uh, i'm sure a lot of people listening who maybe don't have exposure into this world are like but wonder are sh- what did i say exposure sorry hey oh <laughs> so um yeah so what about 
what about the whole idea of creatures gobbling you up? Like you're you're sitting there floating in the water, and for people that don't surf, for some idiotic reasons, sometimes you feel like the surfboard is almost like a a protection layer. Like it almost makes it's like a security blanket, but you're just kind of floating around with your like whole body just dangling in the water. And even though like realistically that doesn't make a difference, how do you get over the mental obstacle of just kind of dangling, you know, uh, with creatures with very large teeth below you? Hold that thought for a minute, because you, not, you reminded me of a story. This is real. This happened when I was about well, somewhere between one and two years old, I think. Oh, Maybe between two and three years old. I was with my family, and we were, we were walking down this uh, we walked down this bush track to the beach. This is in Tasmania. And I'm with, I'm with my two triplet brothers. We're standing on the beach, and mum said, just stay here, right? And she's gone into the water. And, like, this kid has never seen a wave before. Right? I've never seen a wave before, so I don't have any concept of it. So I'm sitting there on the beach with my brothers, and suddenly the, the ocean opens its mouth up and eats, eats my mum up. Like, a wave broke over the top of her. But yeah. to me, it, the ocean ate her. Oh, my God. Yeah, I'm just like, ah! <laughs> 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 it really does look like that too. That's so, pretty crazy. So that was my first impression of the ocean. It didn't scare me that. I mean, I, I was always fascinated by the sea because it had this be- it had all these amazing smells, you know, like the rotting seaweed, and it was just a wondrous place to be. You know, that beach. It, it was always been a wondrous place. Yeah. But getting back to the, your question at hand, which was about the sharks. Okay, so. Yeah, that's always been something that bothered me, especially in my early days as a tra- surf traveler because, you know, when you travel, you don't really know what's going on locally with sharks and stuff, so it's always a bit of a leap of faith. And I basically came to the conclusion that as long as the water is clear, I really don't have a problem swimming. It's when the water is murky that I don't really want to swim. And I didn't really know why, but it made a lot of sense later because – what it is, is sharks, um, they are visual. They, If they can see you, they generally will leave you alone because we're just not on their menu. They look at us and they go, what's that? Let's keep going. Tiger sharks, on the other hand, their opportunities, they'll throw anything. So tiger sharks are more dangerous. Yeah. But um, if the water is murky or the, the rivers have been running, don't get in. That's my rule of thumb because – when the water's murky, they come in looking for stuff that's washing out, and two, they can't see, so they go on smell, and that's where you will get bitten. And that's why places like Florida, people will get bitten, and then the shark goes away. Yeah, um, because the shark is going only on smell. But if the water's clear, you're good to swim. That's generally my rule of thumb. Yeah, it's yeah. interesting. Where we were in Jacksonville, there was a river mouth, and that was like the yeah. big thing. Like you could tell when it was staring yeah. up. A lot. When we were There'd in Florida, there were, yeah, there was bites all the time, and somehow the locals just get used to it. Like, oh yeah, you know, you got we your, were one of them. Like, yeah, we were out I mean, there. that's true. But we, we did. would have days where we were like, you get that eerie feeling, and you're like, I got to get out of here. I feel it doesn't feel right. Just stay in the clear water, avoid murky water. Yeah, that's really that's interesting. That's my number one rule. Not easy to do in Jersey, I know. <laughs> <laughs> we have our clear You guys do have good surf, though, man. We do. We do, good, actually, yeah. And it's been heavy lately. We, we get a lot of that really heavy dumping surf these days. Oh, it's just amazing how, how perfect the waves are in Jersey compared to the rest of these guys. I mean, yeah. it's, it's loaded. <laughs> John, you... um. You're like the man of stories. You're like one of my friends with like a story for everything. And you were like mentioning yeah. before about your love of 80s music and a story popped in my head that you told us about Blondie. Do you know which one I'm referencing? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we actually were just, uh, we, ju- we were at the See Here Now Festival. We saw her. She in Asbury. Here yeah, we she just found out. Uh, we found out she's a Jersey girl. Yeah. And uh, uh, we were watching her play and that story that you told me like popped in my head. I don't know this story, so you got to tell it now. You don't remember the story? <laughs> no. Yeah. So when I was when I was sixteen, I, uh, I was fifteen going on sixteen, and the local radio station in Sydney at the time, which which was called Two SM, they were they were they had this promotion going where they were giving away two two tickets to this cruise that was going to go, go that was going to go throughout the Pacific with like ten of Australia's best rock bands, 
this thing was going to cruise the Pacific. And I'm like, oh, damn, I'm going to get a ticket on that, you know? So anyway, I did. I, I won it. I, I won it. I, I won it. And my mum made me take my big brother as my chaperone because I was still just about turned 16. Yeah. Um, of course, I never saw my big brother. He's off getting laid every night anyway. So. <laughs> 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 but anyway, um, yeah, so anyway, what happened is the cruise got cancelled. And so what the radio station did was they hired this island in, in Queensland called Great Keppel Island. It's a, it's a you know, beautiful little island. And they hired Blondie to play on the island for about four days. Oh, my God. Every night. And because, because they were touring at the time, so they just got in touch with the promoters and, you know, got them to come up to Great Cup Island for four nights. I think it was four nights. And, um, yeah, so we, we were watching Blondie play in this intimate bar scene every night. It was awesome. So one, one, after, one afternoon I'm walking past the bar and I look in and there's like six guys lined up. And the guy at the front's kissing and I'm like, whoa. Christmas gets us out. So I got and ju- jumped in line, right? Just turn 16, man. Come on. <laughs> I, 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 my turn comes. And this I is just, like when Blondie was like super hot Blondie. Like this is like. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. yeah. Actually, you know, her hair was black. Making, it was only blonde at the front. She's making out with people? This is what's going on. Yeah, she was giving Christmas kisses. So my oh. turn came and I just, I just went for her. <laughs> <laughs> I picture you with like your tongue just slobbering out. Oh I, I, I did. I stuck the tongue. Oh my God. <laughs> but you know, I mean, she wasn't really into it, of course. So, <laughs> as, a, as a sixteen year old girl, are you kidding me? <laughs> oh, Sean, this is why I love you because it's always like the story always goes to the next the next level. That's like the difference with like with like female rock stars and guy rock stars. Because if it was reversed, a lot of guys would be like, "Oh, okay." <laughs> Yeah, well, yeah, I don't know. Funny, huh? um, I but saying. I want to talk about Brazil a little bit because it was Brazil, my of, brush. Yeah, <laughs> it was because of you, Jay, got to go. You guys are roommates. There's like lots okay. of stuff. Yeah, that Sean, happens. you are like, I would definitely put you on the top uh, five or top, you know, few list of, of reasons why my career has been been a career mm-hmm. like i would say you're, you're indirectly Thanks, responsible Sean. for a lot of a lot of the opportunities that i've gotten a lot of the mm-hmm. people that i know has all been because of you you've been like a huge mm-hmm. supporter ever since we met in myspace mm-hmm. and um all because of high and mighty yeah here's the folks here's the here's the thing folks jay was my very first social networking friend oh, and it was yeah? on MySpace. How You're cool is it? It all so started cool. here, bro. Yep. Yeah. God, I wish MySpace was back. They could just <laughs> Facebook's ah, so hard right now. I was so pissed when MySpace like crapped out Me because too. I we were, we were both like working so hard on it. And at one point, oh, awesome. at one point, I remember like what was the top eight or whatever it was or yeah. top top whatever. I don't know. I had like mm-hmm. Shepard Ferry in my top eight. I had like you know you Donovan or, or vice yeah, yeah to, vice versa. So I, was cool, on, I was on, I was on oh, his top whatever, it and it really it, ranked it, you as a person. It was like, it was like before a lot of all of our collective careers like did much. Like he wasn't like who he was now, and we weren't. And anyway, we met, and um, you you know you you've just been like so you're just always stoked on life, and you were you were really uh, supportive of my art, and you loved it, and we connected, mm-hmm. met in Hawaii, and any anyway, long story short, we ended up in Hawaii, thank or not Hawaii in uh, Brazil, thanks to you, and. Mm-hmm. And uh, not only did that we was, end up on the same tour, but we were roommates, which was a fucking trip. <laughs> that was cool. Eh? That was cool. Eh? <laughs> that was the best tour. Oh my god, that's one of the best tours I've ever been on. Yeah, not so, only was it awesome, but like being your roommate and getting to hang out with you. Like I said before, it's like I feel like I was I was like a twelve year old kid hanging out at a music festival because you know you're mm-hmm. like you were just so completely stoked. You're like, oh my god, ah, it's, it's fucking <laughs> sick! And I remember the first like hour we were there, we went down the street to uh, I don't know somewhere in Sao Paulo and stocked up on beer, and somehow we scored some weed, and it was just a big party. <laughs> Yeah, it was a good place, Sao Paulo. But you know what? If anyone going to Sao Paulo, be really careful as a pedestrian. I think it's the most dangerous city I've ever walked in as a pedestrian. It almost feels like the cars are aiming at you for being on the roads. Like people get the drivers get mad at you for being on the roads. I do remember driving. <laughs> I remember them driving us at night, and mm. they w- they wouldn't stop for red lights because they were afraid right. if you stopped, they would like carjack you. Yeah, remember that? Heavy. So we just slow down, have a look, and keep going. Yeah, 
know, but, was, but that was like, you realize how lucky you are to live somewhere like America. Or yeah. Australia. So, like for for me at that time, and going going back to uh, going back twelve years to that time, that was just like way next level for me. Like we were hanging out <laughs> with like these rock stars that were you know well, cool, right? heroes, and there was pro surfers and magazine moguls. It was so next level. Mm-hmm. But it yet, was, uh, I'm wondering where that falls in like your memory of like the stuff you've done because you know the stuff your life has been full of shit like that. Like you've uh, yeah, done yeah, tours yeah. with like Kelly Slater and every literally Sean Thompson, like every pro surfer for the what the past thirty years you've been hanging out with. Actually, Sean, I never really got to hang with him, but he was kind of he, he was a hero of mine when I was young for sure. I, yeah, I, I, I idolized him as a grommet. Him and Mark Richards. Oh, and I was a really yeah. good friend of mine. Oh, he's such a good guy, Mark Who, Richards. Mark Richards, the buddy? Yes. Yeah, oh, he's man, a what's really Such good guy. style that guy had, huh? Well, I've got a great story that Mark told me, actually. <laughs> well, hang on, Mark told me this? Or Ed, no, Eddie told me this. Eddie Vedder. Oh, Eddie, yeah. Yeah, I was, <laughs> uh, I was talking to Eddie. He, uh, he has his birthday parties here some, sometimes. I've been to a couple of them. But I was talking to him one night, and he got – he was telling me how much when he was young, he used to idolize Mark Richards, right? Because he was living in San Diego. He's saying how he'd been out to Hawaii on a holiday and he was on his way back to, to I guess, San Diego. And he saw Mark Richards on the plane. <laughs> and he's running around trying to find something that, that, something that he can use to get an autograph, you know, like Eddie better is? Paper. Yeah, yeah, he's <laughs> running around. And he, he said he settled on this, um, um, uh, he settled on a a, tour, uh, a a a a real estate brochure, <laughs> and he took it over to MR and got him to sign it. And he was like all starstruck by MR. I'm just thinking, that's such a good story coming from Eddie. You know, <laughs> isn't that so awesome? I think that's the coolest thing too. Is that what yeah. what respect surfers have gained just because of like the crazy shit they do. Like you get people like Eddie Vedder and you know, all, there's a lot of, I feel like celebrities that do come to the North shore fairly regularly and they're just respectful of the space. It's not like, I don't know. It ha- it doesn't turn into like a Hollywood thing. They're there and they're left alone and it's a very private place and it's just a nice. Scene. It is like that. You know, a lot of famous people will come here and just chill. Yeah. You know, actually, I remember I was, uh, one night I was just across the street here at Lele's having dinner and uh, Woody Harrelson and Sean Penn walked past, like totally like they were just any, any normal people. Yeah. God. <laughs> and, Lane, and Lane says, she didn't, say it, she didn't say it loud, but I guess it was loud enough for Sean to hear, but she said, oh, there's Spicoli, and I saw him cringe. Spicoli, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I could totally see that. <laughs> oh, man. you guys are like such characters i remember we were hanging out in new york city and like lane got in like this big break dance circle in like the middle That's of right. like uh yeah. the village or something remember that yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah she likes the break dancing you know so how she became a break dancer was um she was a pretty much a champion gymnast at school and she got to within one level of the of the of the, the olympic selections i guess but eventually, she had to give that away, and so what did she do? She turned that, uh, she turned the Olymp- uh, her gymnastics into break dancing. And so, when she was like sixteen and seventeen and stuff, she'd have she'd be walking down the. She was living in Washington State at the time, and she'd be walking down the street with her rolled up linoleum and stuff. And the other guys would see her coming, and they would pack up and leave because they didn't want to get beat by her. Oh my god, that's amazing! <laughs> it's a funny story, isn't it? God, she's so gnarly. Like, I just feel like it's such a. You guys are such a great match. Like, it's such a funny. You got it's. You're so gnarly in all different directions. It's amazing. We're kind of like big kids, really. Yes, you really are. Is there any like? Is we forgot this... to have kids. Yeah, you got, you got dogs. Lots yeah. of dogs. <laughs> Oh, we got a little dog. Shawnee, are there are there any like ego uh, lessons here, or things that like uh, you? Most people listening don't have a wife that's like charging pipeline and like doing more ballsy things than them. You you know, in a stereotypical relationship, like the guys mm-hmm. surfing or you know into football on the weekends or whatever the hell it might be, and like very very stereotypically that you know. The, well, like uh, you just said, guys packed up because they didn't want to get beat by a girl. So uh, yeah. yeah. So how do you keep? Well, how do you keep like that ego out of it, or has that ever been an issue where you're like, my wife's no. more of a badass than I am? Or like, <laughs> no, no. I think it's just a matter of 
it doesn't really matter what you do in life because everybody's got something that they love to do. And, yeah. You know, that if they, as long as the other person respects that, and, you know, that they, that they have that and, you know, they let them do it and, uh, you know, don't hinder them. I mean, that's just part of a healthy relationship really, isn't it? You know, yeah. everybody's got something that they love to do. I do love that crossover you said about gymnastics into, well, breakdancing, but then into surfing. Because I feel like Mm. we have like a couple of friends that went into skateboarding with gymnastics or snowboarding. Because it is like all that core, all that strength that it can be used in that way. Yeah, it's interesting then, isn't it? Like I saw this program actually the other day. I think it was on PBS. It was about this guy from Canada who'd grown up an outdoorsman. You know, like he's out running around and riding bikes in the bush and all that sort of stuff. And um, he became a paraplegic. Well, yeah, paraplegic, he lost the use of his legs. And so this guy sat down and designed himself a bike that he could ride as fast through the woods on that he used to, and, and he did. And it was a really amazing program. I thought, wow, that's just like the human spirit just exceeding that. And he, he, he made these bikes by using um, – 3D printers. He had like a half a dozen 3D printers and he would Whoa. make his own parts for the bikes. Oh, we're going to have to look up his name for show notes. And, That's cool. Yeah, and, and now that he's made this bike, people are recognizing it and he's actually got a, like a dozen people already ordering one and these bikes cost about the same. I think he said these bikes cost about the same price as a brand new Toyota Corolla. Oh my and yet he's already got a dozen people who want to buy one. So not only is this guy back out in the woods doing what he loves, but he's also make, making a living from it. How cool is that? That's just the human spirit. That's, that's like rather than, rather than being um, uh, um, defeated by it, he's, he's embraced it and turned it, into, turned it into something that's giving him back his life and giving him a living at the same time and helping other people. I mean, there's nothing better than that, really, isn't it? Yeah. Well, so I want to go back to a little bit about your like daily. So you say you wake up really early in the morning. You're still photographing every day. Is that still the daily thing? As much as I can. I mean, it depends on the weather, obviously. But, you know, I, ch- I chase certain conditions. So it depends on what I'm looking to shoot. So are you only on the North Shore? Or do you travel throughout the islands? I mainly just shoot around here, actually. But yeah. uh, there's a lot to see and do right here on this island anyway. <laughs> it's a very giant place. Actually, I've also got, there's a helicopter company right here next door. And one of my neighbours is one of their pilots. And every now and then he'll he'll call me up and say, hey, you want to see? Yeah, okay, we'll be down there in 10 minutes. And off we go. And we did one of those flights the other day. And we were, we were um, flying down the east side. And we, we went past Stairway to Heaven. I don't know if you know what that is. Yeah. But it's just. It's this really big set of long, long set of stairs that goes up these incredibly steep mountains, and it's super illegal to climb them. But here we were flying past Stairway to Heaven, and there was a good 40 people up and down those stairs. It seems like you've been like incredibly like fortunate to have been like born in the, the time period that you have with your career because it seems like nowadays like everyone is a surf photographer and like you said there's not really much money in it per se anymore unless maybe you're like a Clark Little or one of those type of a guys um can you what do you what would you like comment on or talk about as far as the career aspect of photography for for our photographers listening or aspiring creative people what are some lessons or observations that you might have ultimately i think well, for me, the reason I was successful was just because I I, I love I lived it I loved it you know I, I, I was to do uh, yeah you know, if you if it's what you love to do you'll do it anyway and you and you go out, out of your way to do it even if it, even if it's not making you money and eventually uh, if you're good at something you'll get recognised and and um, it, it it can maybe turn into a career. And these days, there's so many different ways to go about having a career, and it seems, um, yeah, it's, it's it's morphing, it's it's ever changing, and I think the success just comes to people who who are just are passionate about what they do, and they find they just find a way. It it finds a way, you know. That's that's what happened to me. Like I, I didn't really go about saying. Okay, I'm going to be a surf photographer. This is this is going to be my living. I just did it because I loved it. And yeah, it just you know opportunities come along. You meet you, you might meet someone who sponsors you, or 
I mean, there's so many different ways things can happen these days. It's a really multimedia thing out there, you know. <laughs> uh, you know, when I was at the top of my game, there were so few of us that were actually surf photographers and, and the surf industry was really, really booming. So it was a good time to be a surf photographer. Actually, when I first moved here from Australia, even that was a huge leap of faith because when I was living in Australia, I was dealing with magazines and, and advertisers di directly alike, right? But when I moved here, it seemed like the, all the photographers were expected to channel their advertising sales through the magazines. And so I was completely at, at their whim. And I thought, well, I'm not going to be successful straight away because I'm going to be at the bottom of this totem pole. And no, I think I'm just going to continue to do what I've always done. And as it turned out, it was a good thing because the advertisers were really frustrated with the magazines because the magazines were always holding back the best images for themselves. And so when I came along, the advertisers embraced me because I, I was dealing directly with them. And so I was successful just for that reason. And it wasn't like I was trying to undermine any any of the established guys here, not at all. I was just trying to make sure that I paid my bills and continued i would be able to continue to do what I love to do. Yeah, and like like I said, I, I was just going with the with the flow best best way I could, and it worked <laughs> out. So, yeah, things are different these days, but the opportunities are all still there. They come again in different ways. Yeah. So, do you still see like a pull to these surf magazines, or are those pretty much like a few photographers, and that's it's just not really a way yeah, to make money so, anymore? No, not really. Um, surf magazines are. Are hanging, hanging on, what, whichever ones are left are hanging on by a thread. Yeah. But there are a couple. Um, I've always said that the magazines that will stay healthy will be the magazines that don't care about the news, they don't care about contests, stuff like that. They just interest, They just run interesting articles. Yeah, lifestyle and, and content, yeah. Like the Surface Journal. Yeah. And, and that magazine is as healthy as it's ever been from what I can see, and those are the kind of magazines I, I like. There's one in Australia like that called White Horses, and it's an amazing magazine. You should send them some stuff, Jay. Guarantee they'd publish your stuff. I know the guys. But yeah, we'll talk about that later. I'll, I'll turn you on. To but there's a magazine there called White Horses. Beautiful I've magazine. Never heard of that. Yeah. That's another thing I love about you is you're always like you're so like um, great about helping your friends. Like okay. I, I'm sure you're like this with other people because I know yeah. from like anecdotal yeah. stories, but just for me, it's like whenever there's, <laughs> whenever you get an opportunity or you meet a cool person or like you think of a way that you can help me, I'm always getting a text or a call or like an email say, Hey Jay, I just met this guy and you got to meet him and, or you copy us on, on an email. And it, that's, that's just such a great, um, great part of your personality and who you are. And I would imagine that's probably a lot of what also kind of got you where you are. Would you, would you agree? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, when you're, when you're kind of in the art circles or you're an artist, now I'm primarily an artist. I, I, I print, I print huge prints and canvas from my archive, but yeah, as an artist, um, when you're with other artists, we all recognize that, being an artist isn't necessarily a lucrative thing. And so when we see an opportunity to, to get it for, for one of our artist friends, yeah, I'll definitely push that along and give them, a, give them that opportunity because who knows, maybe they'll see something down the line and they'll return the favour, but I don't expect them to. I just, if I see an opportunity to help one of my artist friends particularly, I'm definitely going to take that, yeah, for sure, because, you know, it's not always easy to make a living as an artist. Yeah, so. yeah that's yeah. for sure. Yeah. Especially yeah. As a true like in, 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 into these like niches like surfing or something mm -hmm. like that. It's hard to stay, you know, mm -hmm. relevant, I guess. Well, so talk about you moved into doing more of this close water photography. So is this just a product of your obsession with like the light and water movement? And now yep, yep. that's All just... Yeah, you like started, uh, <laughs> you did these like beautiful like close up uh, like wave formations of like foam and you were shooting these in like probably 05 or maybe even earlier. Yeah. And now it seems yeah. like everyone's doing it. And every time I see someone do it, I'm like, that's that's Sean that started that shit, you know? Like, <laughs> and... Uh, well, that Actually, yeah. someone else did it before me. Oh, did they? All right, we're, my bad. We're, we're all inspired. No, we're all inspired by someone. Yeah. But you know, we we all have our own ways of going about doing stuff too. Yeah. So, you know, and that's where that's where you know, work becomes perhaps a bit more individual. Is if you might do something that maybe someone else has done, but you do it a different 
way. Yeah. And actually, that's always been one of my mottos is, is shoot different. Don't, don't be afraid to lose a few frames in order to gain a, a, a special frame, you know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. But like, for example, if I'm on the beach and there's 50 guys with big lenses, they're all, I know they're all shooting around a thousandth of a second. Right? They're all freezing the action. But I would say if that's the case, I, what I would do, I would uh, – I would go and shoot a slow shutter speed, like a, maybe a, a, a 20th of a second. And what happens at a 20th, it captures, as, as opposed to a thousandth of a second, a 20th of a second captures 500 times more movement. So it ends up making the person look like they're going really fast. We call them speed blues. Actually, uh, I don't know if I coined that phrase, but I have a feeling I did. I think I did. <laughs> Heard it here <laughs> first, folks. Heard it here first. We're just inventing yeah. shit as we go. That's great. <laughs> it's funny. Remember the word you used to, Remember how everyone in the 80s used to say, oh, that's so filthy, dude. Remember that? Yeah. Well, I, I know I start, you always say that. I started the mainstream use of that word. All right. <laughs> and it all came about, this is how it, it started back in Hobart. A friend of mine, I, I asked him, how was the surf today, Harry? He's going, oh, it was filthy. I go, what, you mean it was crap then? Or, no, no, it was really good. Oh, oh that's cool work. Yeah, okay, good. <laughs> and then I moved, I moved to Sydney and I was hanging out at, at Tracks Magazine a fair bit, right? I'd go and see those guys a fair bit. And I was using that word a lot. And next thing I know, it's just appearing everywhere in Tracks. And then from that point, everybody started using it. Oh, my right? God. So, <laughs> <laughs> that's funny how things happen like that, you know? Yeah. Oh man. Well, so let's talk about that, like that history, since I know that HBO documentary is really relevant right now. So do mm. you remember kind of the rise of Kelly? Like, did you see that happening? I never saw the documentary, but I did uh, see the rise momentum of Kelly. Momentum generation. Yeah. It was oh, so good. You? It's so good. But you did see yeah. it happening as it was happening. Actually, I remember resenting the momentum generation a little bit because of the music. I really personally, I didn't like that Kelly punk sound. And I really resented the fact that they pushed the crap out of it. <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> but, but that was there. This is now. Yeah. But, um, um, but yeah, I remember the, the rise of Kelly. I remember when he first he, came, he first came to Australia, and it was a promotional episode. They were talking about this kid, this kid genius surfer from Florida that was just a freak. And I remember going to it. The, the, they actually had a press conference, and I went to that, and I saw him. He was so young. And then he and then he surfed in the uh, pro junior contest. We'd never had an international surfer surf in the in the pro junior before. I don't think so. And he won it. And I, I remember like, pulling him aside at the contest and taking a portrait of him with the trophy. And I've still got that picture. He actually posted it on his page a while back. Yeah. But um, and then that trip I did with him and Kelly to King Island in two thousand one. That was the last time I saw Kelly with hair. After that, after that, he shaved it off. Okay. Yeah. But, um, um, yeah, yeah, it's interesting. It's been interesting to watch his rise. I think I look, I look at all the moments over the years, the one that really blew people away was the 95 Pipe Masters. Yeah. He did a, he did a floater on a 10-foot wave and pulled it. And people were just tripping on that, and 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 he's the one, and he, and he ushered in backdoor as the preferred highest scoring wave. Up until that moment, it was always pipe, but when he he wrote backdoor, suddenly backdoor became the highest scoring wave, and it typically has been ever since. You get a perfect wave of backdoor, you're going to get a ten. Man. Not always the case of pipe. Well, so do you still see these guys at Pike? Like, are they still? There at Piper, or do you just is it like there's too many great waves now? Is everyone just all this over? This season or? has been the big change. This season, the last season, a lot of the guys have just fallen away. Oh, really? Well, what's happened is the the rise of Airbnbs has really, really changed the North Shore. That's interesting. We've got over two thousand of them, and none of them are legal, <laughs> and they've they've changed the community. I mean, a lot of the community has just disappeared. They moved away. They can't afford it. And so a lot of the guys that you used to see surfing part like they aren't even out there anymore. It's, there's a lot of new faces. But there's a new guard coming, totally coming through. Yeah. There's a whole lot of new guys coming through. It just seems like the old guard have moved on and moved on with their lives and they're doing something else now. Yeah, I've definitely seen the change. Like it used to be guys like Mark Healy and Reef McIntosh and, oh, yeah, 
Actually, all those guys are still there. They're all still there. <laughs> you just don't see them as often. Yeah. Yeah, because they, they're basically as they get older, they're wiser and they're smarter and they're picking their days more. The, the monkey's not quite on their back as much as it used to be, perhaps. And so they're just going out on the more perfect days. That's pretty much that. Is. I remember reading one of Kelly's books like a number of years ago, and he like uh, had a little section where he was he actually wrote about you, which I was pretty stoked to like turn the page. Yeah, I had no idea. What do you say? <laughs> you said you're a filthy yeah. bastard. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing good. Don't no. read it. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. No, he, he actually no. He, he said he was very complimentary and just kind of. I, I forgot exactly. I'm totally bastardizing and paraphrasing but he just oh, kind of just talked about you and something about how you're like a wild character and which you are <laughs> <laughs> well i think you're just one of those faces that everyone you're like part of the wallpaper there now and everyone just you know knows you and you're a part of their story which is a pretty cool thing yeah i guess so it is it is interesting you live somewhere long enough and you do become community yeah here in here in hawaii it, it, it fish Kind of unofficial. You're not accepted until you've been living here ten years. That's called Kama Aina, and I'm double Kama Aina now. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. Well, so, so I mean, we could literally go for ten hours talking about your story, Sean. But we're we're gonna wrap it up. I think. Do you have anything else? No, oh, no. I think we covered a lot. I'm like, yeah, yeah. I definitely can and have talked to Sean for hours yeah. on end. So, <laughs> but we're sober right now, so we'll t- we'll cut it out. <laughs> Um, so I do have one last question that I ask all our guests is, what is your first thought when I drop you in your childhood kitchen? What do you think of? Oh, easy. Uh, you know, I used to love the most as a kid. A veggie, of, veggie mate. A piece of fresh white bread with a bit of butter and veggie mate. Oh, my oh, God. Oh, that was so right. Right. <laughs> so nasty. Well, why so now, this do you is, like yeah, this Why do you stuff? guys like that? <laughs> to all of our Australian <laughs> listeners, we don't get veggie mate. Okay. It's so gross. Okay, so look, I, I can tell you why you guys don't like veggie mate. Okay. You guys are obsessed with chocolate and stuff here in America. You've got chocolate spread. What's that stuff called? Nutella. Oh, yeah, yeah. Nutella, but that's something. European. So you guys look at Vegemite and you just assume it's going to be something sweet and chocolatey. And it's not. It's salty. But it's it, like if you know what to expect and you 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 butter it right, you put it on the bread right, oh, my God, it tastes so good. We and like, also, we made it also, a to get didn't, it. Didn't also, we try it in With Australia? Kat and Eric here in right. Australia, yeah. Also, for those folks who drink, it's really good for hangovers. Because oh, it's the really? world's strongest source of What is it actually made out of? Okay, so it's a byproduct of, of beer production. It's a yeast extract. Oh, God, that's product. even more gross, dude. <laughs> 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 it's anything, it's that's, anything that starts with it's a byproduct. A byproduct. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's the world's richest source of vitamin B. Okay. We can yeah, use some really of that. It's really good for you. I'm still not going to eat it. Speaking of drinking, <laughs> did, did you oh, get s- Shawnee, did, did you get sucked <laughs> into like the uh, the whole party scene of like the 80s and 90s surf culture and all that? Like, Not uh, really. Not really so much? No, how, how did you escape that? Because there was a lot of crazy shit happening back then. Uh, well, I've been to a couple of all parties. I guess I remember I was at this party once in the Gold Coast. I was tripping. They were just trashing that whole house. I'm just like, oh, this is kind of like that scene out of Big Wednesday. Oh, my God. These people, the house is just getting trashed. Holy shit. You know, like, you know, I've been to a couple of those parties, but generally, no, I didn't get, go to too many of those. It's so funny. I Man. feel like your personality fits it, but then at the same time, you're so obsessive with your craft that you're probably like, I got shit to do at 5 a.m. I'm not doing exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're right. You're right. I'd much rather be getting up early and, and being productive and creating something than, than lying around with a hangover. Yeah. But Chelsea is Pretty right, bad. though. Like, you, hang, <laughs> hanging out with you, you would assume that you're just like a beer guzzling, crazy like pub the dweller. the Tasmanian <laughs> devil, but you're not well, that in that sense. Uh, I'm just... Uh, just, I am what I am. <laughs> that that says it quote. all. Sean, Sean, Sean Davey, I am what I am. I am what I am. All right, Popeye. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Good. Sean, bro, thanks for, uh, thanks for talking to us. Uh, a dozen or more years of friendship. You've been a great friend, and I uh, love you a lot. This and, is perfect. So can you tell everyone where they can find you? What's your website? Hey, you guys can find me at SeanDavey.com. That's Sean as in, that's Sean as in Connery, Davey as in Jones. Locker. So S E A N D A V E Y dot com. Thank 
you so much, Sean. You're the best. <laughs> Bonus footage here. Uh, little story from Sean Davy about Eddie Vedder. Go. Uh, I was just I was standing on the beach one day at the Pipe Masters, and uh, this guy comes up to me, man hugs me, it, like because I don't know if you guys know, but Eddie's a little bit shorter than most folks. He's probably mm-hmm. maybe. Five eight or something like that. Anyway, this guy comes up to me and he goes, "Hey, Sean, man, talks me." I'm like, "Who is this guy?" I, I didn't know who it was, right? <laughs> and I'm and I'm just I'm just like standing there waiting for the waiting for the ball to drop, right? And Pat O'Connell, this other guy, walks over. His press He walks over. He goes, "Hey, I got your latest album." Al, what's that name? Holy shit, it's Eddie. Fuck. <laughs> what year? Is, what year is that? God. Oh, it was um, maybe. 2006, 2007. Okay. I yeah, it's so funny. And, and, and he's like that. He's, he's amazing. He can just totally blend in. Yeah. He can walk around in public venues and no one's got a clue who he is. You know what? No, it. it's like yeah. I've seen you in action around rock stars in Brazil. And what I think is like so funny to be around <laughs> you, which I, I probably like borrowed during our trip, is like you have no like filter or like um, <laughs> you have no inhibition with just getting in the face. Like you have your camera and people are hanging out in the middle of talking backstage or whatever. And you're just like stick your camera in their face and like just hang out like no but big that's deal. That's the beauty of being a photographer, yeah, right? You get so- to hide behind the camera. And so you just get the shot, whatever it takes. And, and you're like a soap little kids so i could just picture there's, picture you hanging out with eddie and just being like hey eddie like let's hang out like <laughs> there's, there's an art to it though as far as taking pictures um like when i was with eddie hanging out with him and kelly i didn't really shoot that many pictures i could have shot a lot more and in hindsight i wish i had <laughs> yeah. Yeah. but you know um didn't you say that anthony kiedis is always there it, like on the north shore too um i've never seen him here but you know who was here last year was Iggy Pop. Oh, he was whoa. hanging out. I Google definitely wouldn't house. recognize him. What about and, what about uh, what about Barack? Yeah, you never shot Harry. him in pipeline, I bet. <laughs> no, but you know, I remember when he was still a senator and he went body surfing at Sandy's, and there's a picture of him in the newspaper body surfing, and I'm just like, oh, that's the guy! Come on, this guy actually body surfs. I mean, like <laughs> this guy's in touch with the ocean. How could this guy not be good? You know. <laughs> Uh, I feel we, like isn't he back out there a good amount? I feel like he, he, he does. He comes out. He usually makes little um, secret visits. Comes out and hangs out with buddies and stuff. Okay. Yeah. You yeah. See, usually when he does come in, he'll go. He'll go to a restaurant. And you'll hear about it. Oh, yeah. I was at such and such today. Oh, yeah, cool. God, we're so due <laughs> for a Hawaii trip. Yeah, I you really it. are. It's been get us a gig, long. Sean. Find us a place to work, and we'll come out. <laughs> Have paintbrushes. We'll travel. Yes. I oh, totally you could do it. You can totally do it. Yeah. Oh, you got three kids to think about. Yeah, you guys I'm have got a about, lot going on. I'm thinking about my really kids in man. Hawaii. I'm totally into that. It's perfect. I mean, you, I, you, I think you guys, in that, in that respect, you're a lot like me. Like you, you feel you fit as much as you possibly can into each day. Of uh, course. Yes. And my kids, are, it's now like you should hear them. They get home from the busiest day. Like we'll do like this past week, we were snowboarding. They were learning to ski. We were doing all this stuff and we'll get home at five o'clock and they're like, what are we doing tonight? <laughs> yeah. I'm like, what the fuck? I'm exhausted. They're like, what exciting thing are we doing yeah, today? They're like, Where are we going today? That's amazing. And I'm like, um, the library. Like I got nothing <laughs> left. <laughs> Which museums are the- always good. Oh, museums are the shit. Yes, we do a lot of museums, and they're good. Like we just did. Like, what yeah. three year olds do you know that you could take to an art museum that would be there for yeah. three hours and completely? That fun? is cool, man. I mean, like it, it, it is. It's really nice to walk through a quality art museum, isn't it? it and is. as a kid, it. as a kid, I mean, I think that's foundational, isn't it? Yeah, it's really cool. We played games like we had to find like pirate ships and paintings and like they loved it. It was shocking. They did so well. So yeah. Mm-hmm. And we took them we took them snowboarding and skiing this past weekend, which was mm-hmm. amazing. Little yeah. I've never even done that. I've never even done that. Oh God, it's well, so we'll have fun. them teach you. Yeah, they'll teach you. I don't, I don't think I'd want to now. I'd probably <laughs> break it. I know, I know. I can't that's I'm too old to learn snowboarding. <laughs> I ski now because it's just I don't need to start a new hobby right now. That'd be cool. I mean, I would love to snowboard. I remember going and photographing a contest 20 years ago. And they had this fresh powder and these guys, these buddies of mine from Tasmania, were just screaming down this paddock, doing the biggest carbs I've ever seen. I'm going, yeah, that looks like the shit. 
Yeah. <laughs> and you know what? Jay's become more into snowboarding than surfing because it's like so predictable. Like you can find a good mountain anywhere. You can't predict a great wave like on a random Tuesday. So at least not to align with your time off. Yeah. 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 Well, that's right. That's what waves are from. Well, you probably have a Kelly Slater wave pool coming here. You think? I know. There has this been gossip crazy. about that. Actually, they came and and like scoped out some land here, but nothing yeah, like official. Last, uh, was it last summer? Kelly was, had it. Kelly yeah, was here. Summer. Yeah. Oh yeah. There you go. Yeah, so we'll see. It's a pretty amazing looking wave he's got, isn't it? Oh god, it's sick. Yeah, it's like yeah. a skate park for uh for surfing. I love yeah, Jay's it. Jay's debating doing an event in California in June at the one in California, right? Wherever. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, there's a potential event. I will let you know about it if there's uh if it happens and if there's opportunity for the yeah, the Davy Meister. Yeah, we just kind of got the note on it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Sean, thank you so, so much. Yeah, I have to bro. jump off. I don't know if you're going right. to time, but... We've got to get cool. back, back into parenting mode. We go. We'll talk to you soon. Oh, my God. I adore him so much. Sean is like a big kid. Yeah, he is. Freaking love it. <laughs> so funny. I mean, I, like, actually feel like sometimes I'm more, like, overwhelmed by his passion in person, but this was, like, such a great angle to see him at where he's just talking about how much he freaking loves every minute of what he does. And it was, like, cool to see, like the inner workings of his mind a little bit like on how it's just a big game and he just like if he sees something he wants to take a picture of he just does it and that's been his whole career yeah i love how like just his uh stoke just carries him through everything i mean i know he's had some challenging times with business as we all have over the years and i've talked to him in person about that but throughout it all he always is just like a big kid that's just stoked on the on the waves and he's constantly sending me photos and telling me stories and texting me stuff and i think that's such a key to his success is just the idea that he loves every second of it genuinely i know well and this podcast was perfect because i love when it's close friends of ours that kind of forget they're on a podcast and just start yes. people actually get to see like what yeah. we talk about when we talk to these people and, and like, it seems with, to be our, our australian friends the most like, I, know, I was thinking just, of will like the whole time yeah okay. they just get into it but he was literally like i need to tell you the story about a paraplegic or i need to tell you the story yeah. about like and that's how he is like it's just oh my gosh i saw this passion in someone let me tell you about it or i saw a wave that reminded me of you like that's just how his brain connects things yeah when you see his photos his photos are doing the same thing except visually like his photos are are just in your face like look at this it's amazing like it's sick yeah you can always feel his passion behind it that's for sure i want to hear people's feedback on just like i feel like i left this thinking like which parts of my art do i like like which parts of being a doula makes me feel like happy and free and all of that like you kind of find that in how does he exist in that space with every single part of that job? It's pretty cool. That's a good point. Like thinking about your own journey and remembering to have that excitement and that magic in it, even after you're a professional can be very challenging. Yeah. Well, I saw you, you asked that question too, just saying like, how do you keep it alive? And he just said, what was his, I am what I am. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, so many like musicians and artists and other creatives that we know, we, a lot of us experience that thing where you're professional and then you kind of forget that you like love it with complete passion because you get caught up in these moments of stress. And I know Sean has that, but he's just so great at bypassing that in his brain and, and going right towards the excitement of it. Well, and to be honest, like when we've been in his studio, like at his apartment, like he'll go through like every part, things <laughs> that like we don't can't love. Can't help but laugh. Like I mem- remember being in his like little attic studio thing. and He literally is like, like watch me print this. This yeah, is so fun. totally. Like watch me change the ink. This is so fun. We're it's just, just like, like all, of, holy moly. all of the little things that he loves, like photos everywhere and like yeah. hard drives everywhere. And he like knew everything that was in every spot. And it was like, here's all my toys. You got to see this. And yeah, it's pretty awesome. Um, well, I mean, I think that's all we have to say about this one. We adore that's you, Sean. That's all I have to say about that. Yeah, yeah we do love you, Sean. Thanks for Keep sharing on that accent, your personality. Jay. Hey, <laughs> I could do an Australian accent if I want. That was, that was, that was awesome. Okay. That was great. Okay. <laughs> I could convince anyone that I'm a native Australian if Other I really wanted. Other than an Australian, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. All right, guys. We'll talk to you next week on Shifting Perceptions. Mm. Thanks, guys. We hope you loved that episode. Um, If you did love it and could give us some love on iTunes, that would be amazing. You can leave a review and we will give you a shout out at some point on this podcast. Also, if you guys can follow us on social media, we would love to hear from you. We are on pretty much every social media platform at Shifting Perceptions Podcast. 
which is the same as our website, shiftingperceptionspodcast.com. We look and reply to all comments, so please share with your friends, tag us. We appreciate all the love. And don't forget that all of our guests also see all these comments, so I'm sure if you want to just have a space you can reach out, these are the places to do it. Um, We also want to give some love to our amazing photographer that has done all of our photos so far. Kevin Rigby. Kevin Rigby. Um, his website is wavelightstudiollc.com. Dot com. And also our really good friend, John Harvey, who did the music for our podcast. You can find him at Instagram at Harvey Wallbanger. So that's our uh, little rolling credits. We will be back next week.